Honourable Members, the Deputy Speaker. Are there any constituency statements by honourable members? And I call them member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Well, of course, uh, Australian honours to be celebrated uh, by members of community is something that this house often takes note of, and I am pleased to uh, pay tribute today to Brother Nicholas Hazas, who was awarded an OAM uh, on the weekend. Uh, Brother Nicholas was ordered was awarded uh, the Medal of the Australia. Uh, Order of the Australia Medal for Service to Education and the Catholic Church of Australia. Brother Nicholas is a very well-known figure in the Fairfield community. He was the longest serving principal of Our Lady of the Rosary Primary School, which has existed for 90 years. Uh, he is much loved by the many people whom he educated. Uh, he is a patrician brother, uh, and of course the patrician brothers are a very important part of the Fairfield community, with Patrician Brothers College uh, being the high school in Fairfield. Uh, the fact that he was the longest serving principal of Our Lady of the Rosary over its 90 year history is, I think, uh, a sign of his dedication to the community. Uh, and it's not only the length of his service that should be acknowledged, but it's the difference he's made. To know Brother Nicholas is to like him. Uh, to know Brother Nicholas is to be touched by his um, uh, dedication and his commitment to those whom he sought to educate. And I particularly want to note his commitment to educating newly arrived refugees in this country. My community, Fairfield, is the recipient of more refugees uh, than any other community in the country. That's what we do every day. We live it every single day, welcoming, in more normal circumstances than we're experiencing at the moment, refugees every single day from Syria, from other war-torn communities. And of course, that requires a level of commitment, including to educating people, young people, who often have never attended a day of, a day of school in their life because their schools have been bombed or destroyed. They come to Australia, they come to Fairfield, mm -hmm. and we accommodate them in our schools, including our Catholic schools, Our Lady of the Rosary School. Brother Nicholas was dedicated to doing that and ensuring uh, a world-class education for them. His love of education is also exhibited uh, by the fact that he attained a Master's of Education degree 20 years after he began as a teacher. That was his level of dedication to lifelong learning. And he last year celebrated his silver jubilee as a patrician brother, and today he serves on the patrician brothers' congregational leadership team, the worldwide leadership team of the brothers of St Patrick. Speaking last year on his 30 years of service to Catholic education, Brother Nicholas said, a joy for me over the years is the connection that I've made with students and their families. This has been one of the greatest blessings for me. Uh, Brother Nicholas uh, left Our Lady of the Rosary School recently, which was of great sadness to us. Uh, in 2018 he left, but he did go on to become the principal uh, of Holy Spirit Catholic Primary School in Cairns Hill in the neighbouring electorate of Werriwa, which I'm sure I know the member for Werriwa uh, celebrates. I was pleased to support Brother Nicholas's nomination, uh, to be one of his nominators for the Order of Australia, and I celebrate it in the parliament today. Yeah. I call the member for line. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Tauri University's campus will now become a reality with the recent announcement that federal funding towards the new multi-million dollar campus has been secured. This is a fantastic win for the New South Wales mid-coast region. Many people have been wondering whether this would actually come to fruition. Uh, and I'm pleased to announce that we'll, we'll be getting one in Taree. It will deliver enormous social and economic benefits for our region for many years and many decades to come. The Taree University's campus was one of nine submissions to be successful in the latest round of the Australian Government's Regional University Centres, campus, uh, centres program. Tauri University's campus will form partnerships with a number of universities and TAFE to offer a range of courses that deliver a combination of local face-to-face -face, uh, and also distance learning. It's known as a mixed modality of teaching uh, with the assistance of distance learning and has been so successful in Geraldton. In 2018, I established a local steering committee uh, that formed last year again to gather broad community support and develop a funding application for the TUC proposal. This uh, university's campus was one of the primary and most prominent suggestions in a 2030 survey 
I did across the whole electorate, Mr Speaker. People were looking for some tertiary education uh, university presence greater than what we had, which was uh, a single university had a computer lab in town. They wanted more than that, and this will be uh, a real game changer in that space. Uh, a board was appointed of local people with huge experience and backgrounds in academia, business, industry and community, and together with members of the steering committee, we were all able to put together a fairly comprehensive submission. Uh, the Turra University's campus is a community-based, non-profit entity that would rely on a combination of Commonwealth funding, community and in-kind donations. Now that federal funding has been approved to assist with the establishment of the Tari University's campus, the board can now negotiate a formal funding agreement with the Commonwealth Department of Education, Skills and Employment. The agreement will provide assistance for the establishment of the campus and its facilities, along with dedicated Commonwealth-supported places. Now, since this announcement, we've had a huge outpouring of interest and support, like we did when we formed the steering committee. To give you an idea, 17,000 likes without any boosting on facial, uh, social media. I'd like to acknowledge volunteer board members, John Howard, Alison McIntosh, Lisa Proctor, Graham Brown, Maurice Stack and Steve Atkins for their commitment and work in getting us the to where we are today. Member's and also time has thank expired. Maura I call the member for Karangamite. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. This morning I rise to congratulate five constituents in Karangamite who received Queen's Birthday Honours this week. They were Rosemary and Bill Brown from Queenscliff for services to their community, Lynn George for services to engineering and manufacturing, Jeanette Watson for significant services to marine science and ecology, and John Burrows of Queen Ocean Grove for services to the Uniting Church and to the community. Each of these distinguished Australians have made a remarkable contribution to improving all of our lives. I want to single out a couple of recipients to give you an idea of the extraordinary effort they've gone to in order to make a difference. Lynn George runs boutique engineering firm Ostenge with her equally amazing husband Ross in Geelong. Ostenge started around 1985 and has been involved in all kinds of engineering innovation. They are at the centre of the renaissance in advanced manufacturing in Geelong. But if running the business isn't enough, Lynn has found the time over the last decade to be a driving force in building manufacturing networks and ensuring there is real collaboration between manufacturers, researchers and educators. Lynn is chair of the advisory board of the Geelong Manufacturing Council, a network which shares best practice and gets unbelievably excited about invention and innovation. Lynn's a key supporter of the Advanced Fibre Cluster, a network of researchers and manufacturers which aims to make the carbon fibre industry a mainstay of Geelong manufacturing. She's also on the board of the wonderful Manufutures at Deakin Uni, which gives up to 15 startups a supportive home for up to two years to get their business off the ground. It's what every university should be doing more of, and it is what the federal government should be funding. And all this effort is working. We have many more exporters in Geelong now than we did a decade ago. It's no small part, it's due to Lynn George and her colleague, colleagues who are passionate about manufacturing jobs in Geelong. Congratulations to Lynn. I also want to mention Bill and Rosemary Brown. In their Melbourne life, Bill had already co-founded the Werribee Community Centre and Rosemary was on the board for 19 years as well as starting up children's playgroups. When the Browns retired in Queenscliff 25 years ago, they did anything but retire. They volunteer regularly through the Visitor Information Centre, the Queenscliff Historical Centre and the Surf Coast University. Their passion for helping has flowed to their children. Their daughter, Sarah, received Australia Day honours this year for a service to Barona, Baronia Primary School. The Browns have been great role models, not only for our families, but the whole community. Congratulations and thank you to every and each one of you, the Karangamite Award recipients. We're very proud of you. I call the member for Leichhardt. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, tourism is the single most important economic driver in my electorate, and to say that we've been doing it tough is an absolute understatement. We were the first region to be hit, and we'll be one of the last to recover. Our multi-billion dollar local tourism industry literally fell off the cliff overnight. 
the impact has been quite simply devastating. Cairns has become the second most severely affected regional city in Australia in percentage of jobs lost and percentage of loss of uh, gross regional product. And this was reflected uh, in the statistics that were released yesterday. We are number five in the la uh, numbers of people accessing uh, JobKeeper, so it shows the impact of that. Uh, more than $850 million in tourism spent has already been lost to date and with a $2.5 billion forecast in 2020. Mr Deputy Speaker, Cairns' distance from metropolitan capitals and its reliance on tourism and aviation mean economic recovery times will be likely to be much longer than other parts of the country. However, we are being forced uh, to begin our road to recovery with one hand tied behind our back. The mixed messaging from the Queensland Government regarding border closures is doing untold damage to the local tourism business. One minute is July, then it's September, then it's beyond September. But it's OK to protest in Brisbane, where we saw 30,000 people packed shoulder to shoulder for the weekend. Every day our borders remain closed. Cairns and far north Queensland misses out on the opportunity to attract southern tourists and many local operators uh, that many local operators and businesses rely on. Southern tourists are already looking for, to book holidays, especially during the upcoming uh, school holiday period. But sadly, that uh, the message to them is that Queensland is closed for business. Queensland Government's handling of, with regards to Cookshire uh, is another one that is an absolute debacle. Cookshire is, it was, for some unexplained reason, that only the state government can tell us was included in the biosecurity bio region in Cape York. They made a big song and dance when they announced uh, Queensland was open for Queenslanders, but failed to mention that it didn't include Cookshire. Within the boundaries, there's not a single remote Indigenous community, so just beggars belief that it was included. Once again, the mixed message is doing untold damage to businesses in Cooktown, right across the Peninsula Development Road. It's just crazy that we, we're seeing this continue to happen, and the inconsistencies is unbelievable. Yesterday, the uh, Health Minister signed off on the biosecurity uh, for all of Queensland, removing Queensland from biosecurity re uh, restraints as of midnight tonight, and uh, so to, uh, tomorrow, Friday, uh, from one minute past midnight uh, to, to, uh, tomorrow, tonight, uh, Queensland should be open for business, including Cape York and those businesses there. And I'm calling on the Premier to make sure that that happens. And uh, we just cannot allow this to continue to happen. It is a massive impact on these businesses. They've got to start trading and they've got to start trading tomorrow. I call the member for Newcastle. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And it, uh, with unemployment rates at records high and so many businesses operating at reduced capacity, there can be no more urgent priority for this nation than creating jobs and stimulating local economies. The former Labor government recognised this um, sort of important post-crisis stimulus back in 2008, when it committed $26 billion to a far-reaching infrastructure program across the nation, investment that turned out to be central to protecting Australia during the worst ravages of the global financial crisis. Indeed, it didn't just protect us, it saved hundreds of thousands of jobs and shepherded us through catastrophic economic conditions with a AAA credit rating from all three uh, ratings agencies. Meanwhile, every other developed nation uh, on the planet plunged into recession. It's no wonder that the treasurer at the time, Mr Wayne Swan, earned the coveted title of the world's best treasurer. Well, now it's time for the Morrison government to follow Labor's lead and deliver on vital infrastructure projects to stimulate local economies and communities like Newcastle. To be fair, the government has brought forward some local uh, roads funding infrastructure funds. Uh, in my community, in response to a request from government, the City of Newcastle identified $62 million worth of excellent road projects that were or could be made shovel-ready quickly. Projects I was very pleased to support in my letter to the Deputy Prime Minister. I acknowledge that the government did make a very modest commitment of $1.1 million to fast track some of those roads projects, but this investment falls way short of actual need. In Newcastle, there is a plethora of local projects for the government to support, projects that will create jobs and help grow our economy. The list of these vital projects uh, includes Projects like the expansion and diversification of the Port of Newcastle, the Newcastle Airport expansion, the active transport network, 
the Hunter Sports and Entertainment Precinct, the Lower Hunter Freight Corridor, High Speed Rail and the highly anticipated redevelopment of the Newcastle Art Gallery. These are all known projects to the government. Indeed, many of them have ranked highly in the independent reports of Infrastructure Australia. Equally deserving candidates include the management of Stockton Beach erosion, the ferry terminal in Wickham and the flood mitigation at Walls End. And there are also less costly options in the mix, including Newcastle East uh, and streetscape upgrade, an organic processing facility for the Summerhill Waste Management Centre and much needed upgrades for our local sporting fields and facilities. And let's not forget our six surf life saving clubs and ocean bars. These coastal facilities are all in need of, need of upgrades and replacements. Social housing remains urgent. These projects will make a huge difference to my community if they secured funding, federal backing. I'm calling on the Morrison government to help create jobs and drive Newcastle's economy by investing in these the important local infrastructure projects. Time has expired. I call the member for Curtin. I rise today to acknowledge the 40th birthday of the Children's Leukaemia and Cancer Research Foundation in the electorate of Curtin. The idea was inspired by nine-year-old Jennifer Harper, who was diagnosed with leukaemia in 1977. Sadly, Jennifer passed away the year after her diagnosis. This was the tragic reality for the majority of children with cancer at that particular point in time. 50 years ago, only 2% of children with cancer survived. While Jennifer did not survive, her diagnosis and the devastating experience inspired her father, Peter Harper, to take action. Having discovered that there was no research into children's leukaemia being done in WA, he set out to raise funds for that purpose. Over the years, the foundation has raised significant amount of funds for research into childhood cancers. The foundation also established its own research lab in 1983, and since that time it's worked collaboratively with leading world, worldwide research bodies to continue the fight against childhood cancers. 42 years after Jennifer's passing, the overall survival rates of children with cancer has changed from 2% to 80%. This turnaround is phenomenal, and it is because of the incredible research efforts across the world and the funding and attention raised by Peter and others like him that has led to this outcome. But 80% is still not good enough. Childhood cancer remains the single greatest cause of death from disease in Australian children today. It is for this reason that the Foundation, the researchers and the volunteers have no intention of stopping now. And I'm delighted that the Foundation is one of the successful recipients of the Government's 2019-2020 volunteer grants. The Foundation will receive $5,000 to support their volunteers, with funds going towards the purchase of computers and video equipment, so that the volunteers, who make up 65 per cent of those who work with the Foundation, can better engage with the childhood cancer community. I'd also note that providing support for the Foundation is even more significant this year because in recognition of the huge impact the COVID-19 pandemic is having on many of their traditional supporters, the Foundation made the decision earlier this year to cancel their planned 40-year fundraising campaign called 40K in 40 Days. However, with the same spirit shown by Peter Harper back in 1977, the Foundation didn't just cancel the event, they decided to do something for their supporters, and they turned their 40K in 40 Days campaign into a campaign called the Circle of Kindness. Over 40 days, the Foundation is showcasing and supporting 40 different businesses who have supported them over the last 40 years. I would like to congratulate the Foundation for the vital role they play in raising funds and awareness for childhood cancer research and the positive contribution they make to our community. I call the member for Blacksland. Thank you. A uh, 100th birthdays are a pretty special thing. And tomorrow there's a very special 100th birthday in my local community. The Bankstown Torch newspaper is turning 100. And while other newspapers across the country are dying off, the Bankstown Torch is still going strong. It's loved by my local community. It's how they get their local news. It's now the only local newspaper in the local community. The torch was started 100 years ago by a man named Les English. And today, 100 years on, it's still owned and run by Les's family. Les's grandson, John English, is the owner and the managing director. And his great grandsons, Trent and Christian English, are the general manager and the projects director. And their auntie Pam is also a key part of the team. 
It's a family business. And like most family businesses, the people who work there are also considered part of the family. Mark Kirkland, the editor of the newspaper, has been there and been the editor for 26 years. Kim Cohen, the project manager, has been there even longer. He's been there for more than 30 years. And the torch is also part of the bigger Bankstown family. It's part of the story of the community I'm so proud to represent in this place. It's covered every major event in town over the last 100 years, from the visit of the Queen 40 years ago in 1980, to the burning down of the council, to the elevation of a Bankstown boy to become the Prime Minister of Australia. And in April of 1955, 65 years ago, the torch made the news itself when the building where the torch was published was firebombed and blown up. The rumours were at the time that it was done by the competition, the Bankstown Observer, but it was never proven. But the next month, the editor of the Bankstown Observer and a journalist from that newspaper were imprisoned by this parliament for three months for a breach of parliamentary privilege for trying to influence and intimidate the local MP, Charles Morgan. Now, as we all know, of course, the media would never try to influence or intimidate a member of parliament, and that's why this has never, ever happened again. Mr Speaker or Mr Deputy Speaker, the observer's now long gone, but the torch has never gone out, or at least not for long. Over the last few months, they had to shut briefly because of COVID-19, but now they're back. They've been publishing again for the last three weeks and hopefully they'll keep going for a long time to come because the Torch and the English family are as much a part of Bankstown as Paul Keating or Steve Waugh or Brian Brown and they've been around for much, much longer and hopefully they'll be around for longer to come because there's plenty more stories to tell. I call the member for Chisholm. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. No doubt the recent months have been tough. But thanks to the JobKeeper program, many Australian workers and businesses have been spared the worst economic impact of the COVID-19 crisis. Recently, I spoke with Philip Kong, the general manager of Surrey Park Swimming in Box Hill. Surrey Park Swimming is a facility that many schools and families in Chisholm take their kids for the Learn to Swim program. It is a unique centre that provides mineral-based salt water for swimmers with sensitive skin condition. It is a swimming school that offers professional coaching and training to our elite swimmers. And it is also a place where many of my constituents rely on for employment. Surrey Park Swimming was hit especially hard by this crisis. The nature of the business meant that it was particularly vulnerable to the physical distancing restrictions that were a necessary part of our early response to the pandemic. Through no fault of his own, Philip's business lost 100% of its revenue. No swimmers, no kids, no families, and no jobs for the coaches and staff. And yet, because of JobKeeper, Philip was able to keep on all 73 of his employees. That's 73 hardworking Australians who do not, on top of everything else, have to worry about putting food on the table or looking for a job during a time of global crisis. As the Treasurer pointed out, JobKeeper has provided hope and certainty during these challenging times. It has enabled a connection to be maintained between employers and employees. This means that when social distancing restrictions are relaxed, when the economy opens up again, to which we are all looking forward, businesses like Philips will have staff on hand. They will not have to waste time and precious resources replacing the bulk of their workers. Unlike the Labour Party, the Morrison Coalition government supports businesses and their workers. Local success stories like Philip and Surrey Park Swimming help to remind those of us in Parliament why we do what we do. With the easing of restrictions, it is great to see swimmers are gradually coming back to Surrey Park Swimming Centre. In Chisholm, as in the rest of Australia, JobKeeper is responsible for keeping businesses in business and workers in jobs. 
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Perth. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. My electorate has a very simple question for this government. Where is the Perth City deal? It was promised by this government in 2017. It was promised in 2018. It was promised in 2019. It was promised in 2020. Prime Minister Turnbull first promised it in July 2017, 35 months ago. They built the Eiffel Tower in just 26 months. The Empire State Building was built in 11 months. It's mistake after mistake with this government. The Perth City deal was due to be finalised in April 2019. Then, last year in August, the minister promised he would revitalise the Perth City deal, ignoring the fact it was four months late. 28 October, Minister Tudge said he was, quote, at the beginning of the process, something that was supposed to have been finished six months earlier. March this year, WA Liberal Senator Dean Smith said in the West Australian that he was optimistic the Perth City deal would soon be finalised. What was the truth? We found out on the 13th of May. The government announced it was putting on hold the Perth City deal. You can't just put Western Australia on hold. No wonder people question this government's commitment to JobKeeper when the Perth City deal is more than a year late. I ask again, where is the Perth City deal? Or, to put it in language the Prime Minister might understand, where the bloody hell are you? This government's approach to Western Australia costs jobs. If the city deal had been finalised on time, there would be projects happening right now creating Western Australian jobs. Instead, this government chose to take the slow, lazy option. It's a pattern of underinvestment in Western Australia. Not one project of the National Faster Rail Agency is focused on Western Australia. There is a huge underinvestment when it comes to the Northern Australia infrastructure facility when it comes to Western Australia. But of course, the government has shown us where their priorities do lie. Queensland has a city deal in Townsville. Victoria has one in Geelong. Tasmania has two in Hobart and Launceston. South Australia in Adelaide. Northern Territory in Darwin. New South Wales in Western Sydney. What's missing from that list? Perth, Western Australia. Maybe this government has just run out of ideas, maybe they've run out of energy, or it hurts me to say, maybe they just don't care about investing in Western Australian jobs. This government has broken its promise on the Perth City deal. Broken promises are the only reliable thing that Western Australians can be assured of from this government. They promised that JobKeeper would run until September, but of course, not if you're an early childhood educator. No, you get cut off in July. Now the government, same deal. No support for social housing in their building industry stimulus plan. They never deliver, and it's always average Australians and Western Australians who suffer the consequences. I call the member for Bonner. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. There must be something in the water, because my, in my electorate of Bonner, we've recently celebrated several milestone centenary birthdays, and I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate these constituents. With five 100th birthdays, three 101 birthdays, and even two 102nd birthdays, I took the opportunity to support some local florists in my electorate and deliver some beautiful bouquets to mark these special occasions. In May, we had three 100th birthdays. Mrs Betty Badrick turned 100, and she's still very independent, keeping up to date with the latest news. Mrs Rita Young of Wynnum West also turned 100 in May and celebrated the occasion at home with her daughter. Mrs Young is also very independent and the flowers I sent to her turned out to be in her favourite colour. It must be that Bayside fresh air because Mrs Gwendolyn McPhee of Wynnum West also turned 100 and the family celebrated with her via a Zoom catch up. Mrs Mavis Hayes of Manly West turned 101 and she received my flower delivery as she celebrated with a morning tea with some family. Our final May milestone birthday was Mr William Howley of Wynnum West who turned 101. I called William to wish him well and let me say he was bright as a button and enjoyed our chat about current affairs. This month we have some more milestones. And last Friday I visited Mrs Evelyn Purcello of Mansfield who celebrated her 100th birthday with her family. My flower delivery brightened her day and we all enjoyed swapping <laughs> Italian stories and she gave me some good advice that only a good Italian nonna knows how to do. And on Tuesday, Mr Donald Wilson also celebrated his 100th birthday and enjoyed morning tea at Nazareth House with his sons. Next week, Mrs Hong 
Ti Tran of Murray will celebrate her 101st birthday, and Mrs. Heather Cossart of Karina and Mrs. Gladys Rudd of Burbank both turn an amazing 102. When getting in touch with their families to send out flowers, it is also so pleasing to see the love and care our older Australians are given by their families and how they'll be surrounded by friends and loved ones to mark these special occasions. Delivering some flowers is the least that I can do to celebrate their lives and what amazing lives they have all led. My sincerest congratulations and best wishes to Betty, Rita, Gwendolyn, Mavis, William, Evelyn, Donald, Hong, Heather, and Gladys. In accordance with Standing Order 193, the time for members' constituency statements has concluded. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Australia's COVID-19 health response ministerial statement, resumption of debate on the motion to take note of the document. The question is that the document be noted and I call the Honourable Member for Dawson. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise um, not with any happiness, that's for sure, to talk about this, uh, this statement that has been made on the Wuhan coronavirus, COVID-19. I mean, we've got seven million plus people infected around the world. In Australia, almost 7,300 people that have been infected with this virus, 404,000 people dead around the world. That number is growing on a daily basis. In Australia, thankfully, hopefully, it looks like we have stemmed that tide with a very low number of 102. But that's quite a stark statement to say. 102 people dead is still a lot of people dead. And there are grieving families and friends right around this country because of those 102 people who have died in Australia. We've had, uh, it's estimated, 950,000 jobs lost over seven weeks from the 14th of March through to the 2nd of May. Almost a million jobs gone. Hopefully, a lot of them will return as the economy reopens. But uh, some of them may not. People's jobs that have been lost perhaps for a long time. Businesses that have been reduced to ashes. People's life's work, their life savings that are either on the brink of bankruptcy or have already gone bankrupt because of this event. So it has been somewhat devastating for this country, somewhat devastating for the world, in fact. But I have to praise the leadership of the Prime Minister. Uh, I think that he has been the, very much the right person at the right time in this crisis, this global crisis and how it has impacted this country. I want to particularly say thank you to all of the hardworking health professionals, the frontline responders, these people, quite frankly, put themselves in harm's way during this event. Uh, they're like the SES volunteers that go out during uh, cyclone disasters or bushfire disasters, the country fire brigades, uh, our doctors and our nurses in our hospitals, in the GP clinics, uh, the paramedics, the AMBOs. All of these people, as far as I'm concerned, are deserving of a National Emergency Medal uh, for what they have done during this pandemic crisis. And so particularly to the hardworking men and women who make up the Mackay Health and Hospital Service, the Townsville Health and Hospital Service, to all of those who work in GP clinics, to all of the Queensland Ambulance Service workers in my electorate and elsewhere, I want to say on behalf of the people of Dawson, thank you for what you have done during this pandemic crisis. Now, things could have been done better. Uh, there is no doubt about that. Uh, hindsight's always great, but actually during the event, I, along with other members of, uh, uh, in the Liberal National Party and also in the Catter Australia Party, were calling for there to be regional management, basically a lockdown of uh, North Queensland's borders, I say in inverted commas. Uh, we're not a separate state yet. 
but there are local government boundaries that could have been closed down so that there, there wasn't the spread of this virus. We had 90 plus percent of cases uh, in Queensland originating simply in Brisbane and the southeast corner. So we could have stemmed that, that tide further. Uh, that, wasn't, that option wasn't taken up, but I notice now uh, there's a bit of uh, arguing against the position that she had with North Queensland from the Premier, from Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk. She's arguing that the borders of Queensland need to remain shut for, because of cases in New South Wales and Victoria. Well, the cases are extremely low now and what we are seeing is a devastation, particularly of our tourism sector in places like the Whitsundays. Um, look, uh, I got to say there's rough treatment uh, that, I, that some of my constituents received at the hands of New South Wales health authorities when they were locked down in quarantine after returning from the country, uh, after returning into, into the country. Uh, I'm very disappointed that New South Wales authorities uh, took a bit of a heavy hand with my constituents and uh, I've raised those matters with people here. But look, all of this this, you know, whether it's these issues, whether it's the issues of the people in Peru, and I had constituents that are over there that were struggling to get back home, people on cruise ships that were struggling to find a way home, um, they were great difficulties that were managed through. But we've got to say, out of all of this, look at the root cause of this problem. And I hold one single entity responsible for it all, and that is the Chinese Communist Party. It is a virus that they unleashed on the entire world that has caused such devastation, caused such a death toll, uh, caused uh, 102 deaths in this country, uh, jobs lost, businesses lost, an economy that was okay, that was going well, uh, that is suddenly looking very, very uh, uh, bad indeed. Now, there was a, a cover-up by the Chinese Communist Party. It's quite clear that the matter was covered up. I mean, we had doctors that were being silenced. Uh, the well-known doctor, Li Wen Liang, uh, who died of COVID-19, who uh, was silenced. He was brought into a police station and told he was a rumour monger that he had to sign a piece of paper saying that he wouldn't say any more about this. One of the first whistleblowers. There were more doctors that were brought in, hauled in and questioned, arrested, some that disappeared. Uh, there were people that worked in laboratories that were nearby to the Wuhan seafood market that disappeared. Why was there a cover-up? Why did they go into that seafood market and clean it out before anyone could do some proper inspections on the place? Why did the Chinese Communist Party authorities destroy early samples of this virus? Why did they do that? Why was there a cover-up? Why? That question has to be asked and I'm glad that our government has pursued this with the World Health Authority and the World Health Assembly um, because these questions have got to be answered. You know, uh, we don't know where it come from. They say a seafood market, a wet market, but then there's actually sources within the Chinese Communist Party administration that say, no, it didn't come from there, that it come from the USA apparently, that the CIA brought it over. Um, you know, and that, that laboratory that laboratory that exists nearby, I mean, I do think that there is enough circumstantial evidence pointing to that as the cause. And I've been called a racist for that, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, well, there, uh, if I'm a racist for saying that, uh, there's a lot of racists uh, in very eminent positions that are coming out. Scientists, the former head of MI5, um, the US military intelligence uh, operators, uh, apparatus is coming out and saying that this is the case. Um, you know, the Harvard Medical School is, is, is now ha has a study out alleging that CCP authorities had knowledge of this virus back in August by using satellite imagery uh, of the hospital car park in Wuhan and also search terms that were going on from Wuhan that were search terms that are associated with symptoms of a virus uh, such as the COVID-19 virus. Um, we know the cover-up happened. Why did the cover-up happen? And you've got to have a close look at that lab, Mr Deputy Speaker, a very close look at that lab, because actually uh, that lab has been doing some shocking research, gain-of-function research, where they manipulate viruses 
uh, and, and, and can cause quite dangerous outcomes. That's not me saying that. Renowned microbiologist uh, by the name of Peter Chumikov has said that they are doing absolutely crazy things in that lab uh, that, that a lot of people are talking about. Uh, a World Health Organization advisor has said it's likely that it leaked from that lab. Jamie Metzel, who's a member of the WHO's International Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing. And this is one of the early signs. When this first came out, uh, the Southern China University of Technology uh, released a report by Boto Zhao and Li Zhao, which said that somebody was entangled with the evolution of the 2019 NCOV coronavirus in addition to origins of natural recombination in intermediate host, the killer coronavirus probably originated from a laboratory in Wuhan. Eminent scientists in China itself said this probably come from a laboratory. There are a lot of questions that the Chinese Communist Party has to answer and hopefully we will get those answers because of Australia's initiative. The question is that the documents be noted and I call the Honourable Member for Kingston. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, uh, Australian's sense of mateship is of its clearest in difficult times and throughout this once in a century pandemic, we have again proven that we are the lucky country. However, I believe there is a clear difference between sheer luck and being extremely fortunate. I do not uh, regard Australia's ability to weather this crisis as pure luck. Uh, and it has been as a result of hard work, hard work by every Australian, hard work by everyone working together uh, to ensure that we are in the good position we are. And I think what has been one of the uh, lovely things coming out of this crisis is the attention and care that, has been, that individual Australians has given to their neighbour. There's been spontaneous groups being set up around my community, set up to ensure that your next door neighbour is okay. Obviously, you can't see them, you can't talk to them, but you can drop off food, you can contact by, them by telephone. Mm -hmm. And that outreach of support and kindness was something uh, that I, I was really touched by when I myself received a card in the letter from someone down my street saying, look, I'm here to help if you need it. Now, we didn't need help, uh, but there could well have been someone in that street that did. And that thoughtfulness and that kindness is something I wanted to put on record. And I know that it wasn't just happening in my street. I know it was happening all around Australia. People were lending a hand to perhaps people they'd never met before, but were letting them know that they cared and they were there. And I think this is incredibly important. Now, while I say we've done well uh, to come out relatively unscathed in terms of our health from this crisis, at this time uh, I give this speech, it is tragic to still acknowledge that we've lost 102 Australians. 102 Australians have lost their lives. Mm -hmm. And there are family members, loved ones and friends of these 102 Australians that are grieving. Uh, and they are sad. And we need to show them our support love and kindness as well, and to know that uh, we are with them. In my home state of South Australia, four South Australian families are grieving. Uh, now, sadly, around one third of the deaths across Australia are represented by the Ruby Princess controversy, um, a dire consequence and a grave reminder of how important coordinated efforts are uh, to ensure the safety of our community. Of the four South Australians to have died, half were directly linked to that ill-fated cruise ship. So, of course, we do need to make sure that we learn lessons uh, from uh, the things that might not have gone to plan, that might not have been perfect, to ensure that we learn those lessons uh, so that in future, if we face something like this again, uh, we, we know what to do. Of course, um, there has been a big impact on a lot of people's lives, whether that those who have contracted the virus and have had to have uh, medical support, um, or those that have just been impacted by not being able to celebrate with their loved ones, um, not being able to attend fu fu funeral attendances was one of the hardest things, or not being able to uh, uh, visit 
uh, an elderly relative in a nursing home. I know that that has caused a lot of anguish and distress for many Australians. And so I would like to acknowledge that your, your sacrifice. Of course, um, there have also been very anxious people uh, in our community, particularly vulnerable people in our community, people with a disability or chronic conditions, who have been really anxious during this time, really worried about whether or not uh, they um, will catch the virus and what that means for them. And so I uh, recognise that this has been a particularly um, stressful time. And of course, um, a, such uncertainty and, and difficult times does have an impact on Australians' mental health. And I think we need to uh, really acknowledge that. And of course, there's been the economic impact that will be lasting. Uh, that is yet to be fully determined. Um, we know that we're in the midst of a recession and um, uh, how we come out of this uh, will be critically important. Industries and businesses have been hit hard um, and many without the ability to adjust their uh, services um, in a 2019 uh, COVID-19 climate. And I, I would like to acknowledge um, those that have been able to adjust their business. Um, congratulations and well done. Those that haven't, we, we understand and we are thinking of you. Um, so there has been, uh, while um, you know, care and compassion, there's been a, a lot of difficulties as well. And uh, I would like to uh, place on record my appreciation for all the sacrifices Australians have made to ensure uh, that we uh, protected the health of all Australians. Um, I would though also like to ex um, uh, list a, a number of thank yous. There's particularly, obviously, our government, our opposition, both on a federal level and, and a state level as well, have worked constructively during this pandemic um, to actually look after Australians and work to, in the national interest. And I'd like to do a shout out to our, our um, medical officials, our chief medical officers, uh, both at states and territory level and the Commonwealth, uh, and those that support them. Um, this has been probably, both in South Australia and in the Commonwealth, it was a new job for both the chief medical officers, and I'm sure it's been a, a huge experience for them, but thank you for their uh, input, advice and commitment. I'm sure they've been working a, a, a huge amount to flatten that curve. Of course, there's been many other workers. Um, there's been the health frontline workers, and they deserve our big thanks. Um, the care, the compassion, uh, the prioritising of need, those that uh, uh, have uh, been in aged care facilities, our cleaners and support staff within our hospitals and healthcare settings have been critically important. And while many of us have been able to work from home, there's been simply those jobs that we've relied on where they can't work from home because they are there to look after us. They are there to care for us. So I would like to say thank you. To our early childhood educators and our teachers, this has been a very difficult time uh, for those uh, individuals. Uh, for early childhood workers, their work didn't stop. Children kept turning up, those children of essential workers, and it's pretty hard to distance, uh, socially distance in a early learning and care setting. So they kept turning up uh, and looking after children. And, uh, you know, um, it would have been a very stressful and anxious time for those early educators, uh, but they provided their high quality care that they always do. And for our teachers, it was a very confusing time uh, for them. Um, in a fast paced uh, sort of place, they had to get their online offering. Uh, very, very quickly, their online offering for those students that could stay at home. But of course, there was always children that needed to go to school in a physical environment. And the teachers and the school staff and the principals and everyone worked very, very hard to make sure children are, were, were looked after. And of course, as we move forward, we need to make sure that they're not left behind. Now, there was also the other workers, the other workers such as the retail workers, the cleaners, the transport workers. 
These workers are some of our lowest paid workers in the community, but they kept turning up to work to make sure we could get our groceries, to make sure that surfaces were clean right across Australia, whether that was in hospitals, GP clinics, supermarkets, wherever there was essential services being provided, cleaners were there to make sure uh, that they were safe environments. And of course, our transport workers making sure that goods got to where they needed to go and that that essential public transport was still available, that those that needed desperate services were there. And of course there's all the emergency services that couldn't stop. If there was a fire during COVID, if there was a, 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 a weather event, there were still needed to be emergency services. Ambulance officers, uh, everyone had to still be on deck to look after our community and I'd like to say thank you. And of course, there was our support services and volunteers, emergency food relief, mental health, whole range of other services that were still needed in the community. And those social and support services, workers and volunteers in my electorate, as I'm sure around the rest of Australia, were working very, very hard. So while we're not out of the woods yet, um, the work we've done so far is critically important. Almost exactly 100 years ago, Australia was in a similar position. In 1918, we weathered the Spanish flu pandemic better than other countries. But there was a second wave that was very devastating. So we can't be complacent. We all need to work together and ensure that we stay vigilant to ensure that this doesn't happen. But on behalf of my, uh, uh, to my community, to the rest of Australia, we say thank you. Yeah. The question is that the document be noted, and I call the Honourable Member for Oxford. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm delighted to follow on from my friend, the Member for Kingston, and particularly want to acknowledge the work that she has done in particularly a difficult set of circumstances, advocating and leading on behalf of our early educators and childcare sector. And I place on record my thanks to the people of Oxley for her work. Uh, because I will be focusing a lot on my speech today. There's a lot to get through, but I want to focus on the people who have missed out uh, and who have been forgotten during this pandemic. Not only am I a proud member for Oxley, I'm a proud Queenslander, and I want to remind the House just how well my home state has done. As of today, there's tragically been six loss of lives, five related to cruise ships entering our country. Uh, there have been 236,000 tests, and of course we know in our nation we grieve and remember for the 102 souls that have been lost, and particularly keep them in our thoughts and prayers as we gather in this parliament. And I want to start off by acknowledging the work of our Queensland government, local government officials that have really led from the front to deal with this pandemic. And of course, I place on record in the, it, it, of great thanks to the Premier of Queensland, the Honourable Anastasia Palaget, who has led our state through one of the most uncertain periods with the COVID-19 outbreak. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Premier's leadership has brought us to a very low case number in currently active in Queensland, and we hope this streak continues while we are all mindful of social distancing and, of course, responsible behaviour. I've been so proud and honoured to be the member for Oxley during this time in our nation's history. And in the first weeks when the pandemic hit, I held conversations with local community and business groups, churches and organisations right across the electorate. What I saw, Mr Deputy Speaker, was an outstanding contribution from all of our schools, small businesses, cultural groups, volunteers, uh, faith leaders from across the Oxley electorate all pitch in together. The community has shown great resilience during this difficult time, but I want to say it has not been easy. I think of the 13,000 small businesses in the Oxley electorate, and I think of all the jobs and some of those businesses that have been lost. I think of the long lines outside the Centrelink offices. I think of the early childhood educators that are still in need of support. And then we know that there are just literally millions of Australians that have missed out on income support. Whilst Labor offered its support for the government's 
response, we know that the one-size-fits-all approach simply didn't cover everyone and so many Australians have been left behind. With 13,000 small businesses in the Oxley electorate and with our hard-working Chamber of Commerces, the Centenary Chamber of Commerce and also the Springfield Chamber of Commerce, I was really, really proud to see them pull together and make sure that they are still delivering outstanding services and businesses to many in the community. I partnered with some of our state members to make sure that we did a Tuesday check-in, which was an awareness campaign that we did so that the community knew which businesses were open, which support were available, uh, and how we could shop local and buy local. The more we do that, the more we keep money circulating in our local economy, the more we do that, the more our businesses will survive and grow. We know, and I know, coming from a small business background with my parents running small businesses, just that small business is the backbone of our economy and just how they are the unsung heroes. The mums and dads who take a risk, go out, enjoy free enterprise with the hope of improving their lives and their family lives and how many of those people have been impacted by COVID-19. So I salute the businesses in the Oxley electorate and I thank them for their service and also their dedication to employment, to providing an economic support base for our community. And I know they're not out of the woods yet and I stand shoulder to shoulder with them as we get through this. Now, over the last month, um, as I've been in contact with our early childhood educators and our childcare centres, uh, and I know after some of the most uh, difficult employment situations, they were left stranded by this government. The so-called announcement of free childcare was a headline, but actually didn't deliver free childcare. Now, the most challenging that we've seen people of trying to access JobKeeper payments, and now when they finally got JobSeeker, the government announced a broken promise to withdraw JobSeeker. Uh, now, just when they're back on their feet, we're seeing, I think, a pretty cruel measure by this government for a sector that more than any other has delivered the support and care for those children of frontline workers. I think treated as second class citizens. They're harsh words, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I think it needs to be said. The stress placed on these workers and these families is unfathomable and the mental health of our community continues to be forefront of what I stand for. Now, my electorate is an extremely diverse and home to many Australians, around 50,000 people who were born or had a parent born overseas with many ethnic and religious backgrounds. And one of the key areas that I've been most disappointed in the government's response, it hasn't got a lot of cut through, it hasn't got a lot of headlines, was the way that we have treated international students. I've got a number of churches and welfare organisations that have had to fill the gap because this government has refused to take action on the care and welfare of international students. I recently visited River Life Community Baptist Church whose members have generously donated thousands of dollars towards food parcels, financial relief and other assistance for many international students they are connected with. Now, we know what the contribution for international students makes to our Queensland economy and national economy, but sadly, many of these students have not been eligible for JobKeeper, JobSeeker or any assistance at all. And the fear and the concern by so many international students who haven't been able to return home because of closed borders, that want to remain in Australia to continue studies, but are financially at, at really breaking point. Uh, and I've heard stories about students being exploited, uh, students who have been uh, evicted from their homes. The whole tragedy, we as a society and we as a country must do more to look after and protect the most vulnerable. And some of those people right now are international students. As I said in my earlier remarks, the state governments have played a huge part in delivering the COVID-19 and they continue to play a crucial role. And I want to take a moment again to acknowledge the work of the Queensland Government alongside the newly appointed Deputy Premier and the Health Minister Stephen, Stephen Miles and the new Queensland Treasurer, Cameron Dick, who happens to be my brother as well, 
uh, in his spare time. They've continued to serve Queensland well throughout this unprecedented time. Uh, early on in the piece, the Queensland government took the lead uh, and released their own response website. This helped direct Queenslanders to one place to help the most vulnerable and support they receive. Having pledged a $3 billion package in funding for jobs and businesses, rental assistance, utilities and a jobs finders program, the Queensland government really has been at the forefront or the gold standard when it comes to the response. Now, we've also seen a $17 million package from the Queensland government directed to the University of Queensland for vaccine research and production and a further $28 million for mental health support services. As I said, the work that the Premier of Queensland has undertaken alongside the National Cabinet has been absolutely outstanding during this difficult time. Now, we often say that Queensland not only has flattened the curve, but it's smashed the curve and amongst the fewest cases of COVID-19 in the country. Now, this has had some um, strong reactions across the community, but the Premier has always indicated the imperative that we work together to respond to this health crisis so that we can tackle the economic crisis that our Queensland, Queensland will face, no doubt, as a result of this national pandemic. I also want to quickly acknowledge the work of the Care Army, which was set up by the Queensland Government, which enabled thousands of Queenslanders to come together to help, just like we did with the recovery of the 2011 floods. The Care Army has put Queensland's back in the hands of those who can help each other and particularly those who are most vulnerable, such as the elderly and those who have lost their jobs. So while we're not over this yet, we've still got a long way to go. I pay credit to all of the volunteers, the community groups and the Oxley electorate, those wonderful people that call our community home. I thank the member for Oxley. Uh, the question is that the document be noted and I give the call to the member for Newcastle. And thank you, Deputy Speaker. Firstly, I'd like to say a massive thank you to everyone in Newcastle for the incredible lengths that you've gone to uh, to support and protect each other during these times. The community organisations that almost instantly rallied to identify people in need and to uh, work out ways in which they would be able to best help. To the businesses that put in uh, their own, face their own significant challenges, I guess, putting those aside to help health workers and those in our community who were doing it tough. To the individuals who reached out to offer support to strangers and friends alike. To everyone who sacrificed so much to keep our community healthy. Uh, you made me, indeed all of us, so proud to be Novacastrians. We are living through historic times and COVID-19 has affected every single one of us. And it's changed our lives in ways that uh, would have been very hard to imagine just a few months ago. Of course, uh, one of the most catastrophic impacts of this crisis has been the sudden hit on jobs. And I would also like to take this opportunity to, uh, for all of those civic leaders, um, people who are um, critical thinkers in our community, and to many of the grassroots uh, activists and volunteers who, uh, you know, really generously gave of their time with me to ensure that I understood uh, the challenges and the impacts that this sudden loss of uh, employment would mean for our region. I don't think that any of us would ever forget that uh, week when our Centrelink offices were filled to capacity and indeed the lines spilled out the streets and around uh, corners. This was a confronting sight for many in our community uh, and for many of the people lined up. It was the first time in their lives they had ever engaged with Centrelink. A key factor to addressing this unprecedented spike in um, job losses has been the JobKeeper wage subsidy. Let me be very clear, Labor supports the JobKeeper um, program. Indeed, we called for it for many, many weeks and we were relieved that the government finally uh, seemed to have understood the absolute necessity 
uh, for such a for a wage subsidy scheme in order to protect livelihoods, but also allow businesses and workers to remain uh, connected, so that when the time comes, they could uh, quite rapidly uh, get back to work. But this support was never without constructive criticism uh, from opposition, and the, uh, this was indeed a very good program, but implemented very badly. From day one, Labor has said that the scheme should have been better targeted. But this hasn't happened. And in my community, thousands of people who should be getting JobKeeper uh, support aren't. And while some that don't need it are getting it. And tragically, some of the hardest hit industries are also the industries with the highest number of workers who are ineligible for support. Uh, take retail or food and accommodation services, the third and fourth largest employing industries in my electorate. Uh, a huge number of businesses were forced to shut their doors, leaving staff jobless and in uh, precarious financial situations. And a lot are still trying to work out if it's financially viable to open up again under the current restrictions. But many of their staff are ineligible for the JobKeeper payment because they've worked with their employer for less than a year something that is absolutely normal in these increasingly casualised industries. Likewise, a huge number of people in Newcastle's large, vibrant arts community also missed out. Why should these people be excluded from support because of the industry they happen to work in? I've also been worried about the thousands of international students in Newcastle who have found themselves without income with no capacity to return home, but they're ineligible for both job seeker and job keeper payments. While the University of Newcastle has been incredibly generous in providing support for these students, it shouldn't be up to the universities alone to fill this gap, especially given the dire financial pressures that are now facing our universities in Australia. Remember, this is a sector that has received zero support from this federal government. The universities have received nothing. For those that are lucky enough uh, to be able to get access to these payments, they have held off uh, financial cat catastrophe. And this makes uh, the government's insistence that the increased job seeker rate, along with the job keeper program itself, uh, will abruptly end in September even more reckless especially given the mortgage pauses uh, that the banks have given homeowners to provide some breathing space is set to end at about the same time. Concerns about debt are legitimate, but the government needs to be very careful about the consequences of such a change in an economy that is still extremely fragile. If incomes are slashed and debts are called in before economic activity has recovered sufficiently, the outcomes will be dire and any perceived uh, savings will quickly be outweighed by the devastating impacts of mass defaults and flatlining economic activity. I'd like to move now to childcare workers, because regretfully the government seems deaf to the warnings that have been raised across the social and political spectrum about the importance of continuing this protection until the economy has demonstrated it is strong enough to stand on its own. Because this week we learned of plans uh, to begin the JobKeeper shutdown um, to some of the most vital workers in our economy, the very people who, are, who were absolutely integral to uh, ramping up the recovery. I, of course, speak of the early childhood educators. At the same time, the government will rip away the support it offered to families uh, with their help with childcare fees. Families were already hammered by high fees before COVID-19, and fees are climbing more than 7 per cent in a one-year period alone. Now, when parents are earning less or have lost their jobs, this snapback will make early education and care completely unaffordable and inaccessible for many. For many families thinking about going back to work or increasing their hours, this announcement could lead them to think twice before because of the crippling cost of childcare. The government must also guarantee bringing back fees won't result in plummeting enrolments and attendance rates and again threaten the viability of services. I'd also uh, like to just highlight a really critical issue um, 
in terms of the diabolical increase in domestic violence in recent months. Uh, you know, we know that violence against women and children worsens in the face of job losses and financial uncertainty. Add to this the increased pressure of families being largely confined to their homes and the risk of domestic abuse increases even further. The COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the brutal reality that for many women, home is not a safe place to be. In my community, I've uh, remained in close contact with a number of frontline services who help women and children fleeing uh, domestic violence. Places like Nova for women and children, the uh, Walganago Women and Children's Refuge and Jenny's Place. They've told me that while the number of women contacting them about uh, domestic violence is up, they are expecting uh, this spike to further as the lockdown conditions ease. For the past few months, women, uh, many women and children found themselves trapped at home with the perpetrators, unable to reach out for help. But this will soon change and many providers must have the resources they need to respond. I'm heartened that the parliament will now undertake a comprehensive inquiry into family, domestic and sexual violence in Australia, especially in the context of COVID-19. Uh, I acknowledge the chair uh, and his role and I'm honoured to be the deputy chair for this important work. But it won't be enough. We urgently need to investigate and, and in, invest rather in our frontline services to help women and children escape family violence, and we need that now. Uh, I have called many times in this parliament for assistance for Jenny's Place in Newcastle to adequately fund a, an important telephone resource helpline and have been buck passed from one level of government to the other. Nobody wants to own this problem, uh, yet for $300,000 investment over a three-year period, this parliament right now could make the difference to so many lives in my region. It's unconscionable to me that this has not um, been taken up by the ministers to date. In summary, there are so many elements of the government's response to this pandemic, which does have Labor's support, but there are areas that we know it's not enough. We must do better. We will hold government to account. Thank you. I thank the member for Newcastle. The question is that the document be noted, and I give the call to the member for Indi. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I've been in the healthcare workforce as a nurse, as a midwife, as a rural health academic for over half of my life. And from experience, I know what's important in a crisis, and that's clarity, consistency, and making decisions based on evidence. And these qualities have been on display since day one. There's been no fear to experts taking centre stage. Compared to other countries, it's clear that preferring scientific consensus over political expediency has set Australia apart. In a few months, we have gone from a nation slow to react to a horror unfolding in a distant place to one leading the world in flattening the curve at home. I thank the Minister, the Chief Medical Officer and his deputies, the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee and the hardworking Department of Health staff and their counterparts in states and territories for their leadership, which has brought us this far. And today, on the 11th day of June 2010, there is optimism in the air. It does feel like we have turned a corner. But only a fool would dare to make predictions. Two months ago, Parliament was suspended for five months, yet happily we're here today. Three months ago, our Deputy Chief Medical Officer said the best case scenario was a sobering 50,000 deaths. Six months ago, COVID-19 was a meaningless collection of letters and numbers. Are we halfway through the crisis or has it only just started? What we do know is that it's far from over. Last weekend, after 71 days of zero reported cases in my electorate, an aged care resident tested positive to COVID-19. Cases like this will continue to happen. The difference now, though, is we are prepared. Today, I want to pay tribute to the extraordinary commitment and achievement of health care workers in my electorate of Indi. Our nurses, doctors, allied health professionals, disability and aged care workers, our pharmacists and GPs, our health care administrators, administrators and leadership across the board. Their hard work has transformed our local health care system into one prepared now for whatever may come. 
The two large public hospitals in my electorate, Albury Wodonga Health and North East Health Wangaratta, rapidly boosted their capacity to address any surge in COVID-19 cases. In partnership with private hospitals, they pooled infrastructure, workforce and supplies to meet demand while keeping other patients safe. Their screening clinics have conducted thousands of tests and fielded many times that number of calls to their hotlines. Sally Squire, Director of the Pandemic Response at Albury Wodonga Health, and Rebecca Weir, Executive Director of Clinical Services at North East Health, have been central. My constituents report the screening clinics are smooth and well attended. I congratulate Albury Wodonga Health and North East Health Wangaratta for their clear and engaging communication about COVID-19. Advice from a trusted institution is invaluable in uncertain times, and I have no doubt that their Facebook posts and media posts generally have changed behaviour and led people to take social distancing seriously. Last month, I was proud to open the Wodonga Respiratory Clinic at the Central Medical Group with Drs Greg Gladman and David Tillett, and General Manager Suzanne Fisher. This clinic is responding to huge levels of demand for testing, particularly for children under 10, and easing pressure on the public health system. Another clinic leading the way is TriStar Medical Centre, next door to my Wodonga office. This service has a multicultural, elderly and family clientele. They were early adopters of proper hygiene measures, setting up a sanitizer station with masks outside the clinic, and they have excellent isolation and barrier techniques in staff for, for all, uh, all their clients. Benella Health's drive-through testing service began in early April and is now completing a blitz of nostril tickling tests for teachers returning to school. Benella Health sits on the Benella Central City Rural City Pandemic Committee, which is a fantastic model that brings together government agencies and healthcare and aged care providers, including Carrier Street Clinic, Church Street Clinic, Costa Street Medical Practice, Coinda Village, Estia Health, and the Royal Freemasons. Mansfield District Hospital, in consultation with the Department of Health and Human Services, the Mansfield Shire and Mansfield's general practices began preparations as early as January and are working under the Shire's multi-agency pandemic plan. And I thank especially our CEO of Mansfield Health, Cameron Butler, for his extraordinary leadership during this time. The Yea and District Memorial Hospital and Alexandra District Health have continued their excellent record of dedication and care for their patients and their community while taking measures to keep everyone safe. Our local emergency food and relief services have pivoted to provide a vital lifeline to emerging pockets of need, to people isolating at home or the newly unemployed who never dreamed of accepting charity. These services include Albury Wodonga Regional Food Share, Mansfield and District Welfare Group, Quercus, Beechworth, Salvation Army, Uniting Limited, Vincent Care Victoria and Loaves and Fishes. In a frightening time where we often think of ourselves first, thank you for not forgetting the vulnerable. The shift to universal telehealth and assurances from the Minister for Regional Health that it's here to say is the brightest silver lining in this pandemic. Telehealth can dissolve the regional and geographic financial barriers to healthcare across rural, remote and regional Australia. Across Indi, telehealth consultations are now happening with speech pathologists, physiotherapists, dietitians, social workers, occupational therapists. The impact will be transformative. I'd particularly like to give a shout out to Claire and Sean Wharf of North East Family Medicine, who did a trial telehealth video with me on Facebook right at the beginning of this pandemic to give people reassurance about how easy it is to have a telehealth consultation with your, with your family doctor. The community has stepped right in behind the healthcare front line. Galen Catholic College student and innovator Ryan Falconer assembled a team to produce 3D printed face shields and bands for North East Health Wangaratta. With the help of VEDEX coordinator Marie Timms, 3D Printing Lab, Biofab 3D, Bet Ambrizo and Craig Murphy from Go Tafes Innovation Hub and Rowan Latimer of the Jewellers co-working space, dozens of face shields and headbands have been added to supplies. So school kids and innovators across the electorate have got on board too. Across my electorate more broadly, amateur tailors and accomplished seamstresses are putting the pedal to the floor to stitch scrubs and face masks, 
Pangarang Community House has coordinated sewing volunteers and the Upper Kiwa Valley Community Association brought together volunteers to produce surgery gowns and masks for the local hospital and medical centre. The Rotary Club of Euroa donated free hand sanitizer to the Euroa Health Service after buying bottles in bulk to give to those in need. As a former nurse, I'm proud, but not at all surprised, by the hundreds of non-practicing nurses who did refresher training so they could join the surge workforce. Then there's the nurses who upskilled in critical care nursing so they could support coronavirus victims in intensive care units. To my fellow nurses, whether you stepped out of retirement or out of your comfort zone, your willingness to go above and beyond has been truly inspiring, and I thank you. To the health workforce in Indi, you've had your clinics closed, rotations postponed, plans thrown into disarray. Almost as hard as the, has been the state of readiness that you remained in for weeks, expecting the worst to flood through the door, not knowing if it would. You have worked long hours under increased pressure. Your calm reassurance has made all the difference to your patients and to your peers. Thank you for caring for us and thank you for caring uh, for each other. And to the families and partners of those health professionals, you've let those you love go into danger to protect us from an invisible threat. COVID-19 has made every day uncertain for you too. I see how hard you work to put aside those worries and keep the ship afloat and family ticking along with a smile or with indeed the gallows humour that uh, so many people employ in times of crisis. Your bravery is the unsung hero of this pandemic. Finally, to the people of Indi who followed the health restrictions to stay at home, the same restrictions which have paralysed our tourism, hospitality and accommodation industries and led to job losses, I see the sacrifices you have made. I know it has saved lives. In Beechworth, Bright and Mansfield last weekend, I saw the first real influx of tourists for the year after fires chased them away and COVID-19 locked them out. Before the weekend, business owners told me they were excited but nervous, desperate for customers but scared about disease they might bring. This tension will be a fact of life for months, possibly years to come. But with strong local health system working together with a supportive community, we are now more prepared than ever to face whatever comes. I thank you all. I thank the member for Indi. The question is that the document be noted and I give the call to the member for Werriwa. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Most Australians have never experienced the kind of widespread disruption to our normal way of life that we have experienced over the last two months. There are, of course, members of our community who have experienced similar circumstances of lockdown and shortages. They are the migrants and refugees who came to Australia after their homelands were turned upside down through war and famine. Or our older Australians who remember the Great Depression, World War I and World War II, and the post-war austerity required of our citizens. For the rest of us, however, our societal st structure and way of life has, in no uncertain terms, been significantly challenged. From the ability to join, enjoy the wide open spaces, having a coffee or shopping, to the dislocation and collapse of employment and income safety, our way of work, life at this time is vastly different to what might have been expected at the beginning of 2020. While Australia has done well to restrict the potential for COVID-19 to spread throughout the community, gaps have emerged. We have not ensured that all Australians have a roof over their head, the money for, to pay for food, medical or other bills. The first warning signs came when we all witnessed the huge queues outside Centrelink offices, when a million people lost their jobs overnight as health orders shut down so many businesses. On Monday the 23rd of March, half a million Australians became unemployed for the very first time in their life. Many of them had never had a need to have a MyGov account and the competence of the computer systems that supported Services Australia and Centrelink was clear that it couldn't cope. Unhelpful comments explaining it was a result of a, a cyber attack were unnecessary, inaccurate and not funny. Disaster planning of these essential services was clearly not adequate. Queues down footpaths stretching along streets around blocks and further was a real life example that Australians had no body or nothing to turn to but the government for support. The fact that social distancing was almost impossible in these situations led to more stress and not to mention the stress of employees 
of Centrelink who were needing to deal with these, terror, uh, these Australians. Data from the ABS shows that 780,000 people lost their jobs between mid-March and April 4th. Representatives of the, representative of the immediate impact on people employed by pubs, clubs, gyms, cinemas, beauty salons and any other business that deemed themselves non-essential. The same data also shows that some of our most vulnerable are bearing most of the burden of this number, the youth and, the, and older Australians. Over two million Australians are now unemployed. So these extensive job losses, especially considering the demographic of those bearing much of the burden, you can only imagine the stress that our frontline workers in our social security system are experiencing. When I hear the stories of abuse and shouting at people who are, coming, who are just coming to work um, to help others disappoints me greatly, especially when those throwing the abuse are the people they're trying to help. Unfortunately, despite the fact that both JobSeeker and JobKeeper will help many Australians affected economically by the virus, there are so many falling through the gaps. And I'm not just talking about the $60 billion accounting error. Take, for example, one of my constituents who called me in April. He runs a business that employs six staff and sub subcontracts to live entertainment and catering. Naturally, his business was all but effectively halted. He, like many business owners, did not have the capital to pay all of these, this work, these workers' salaries until JobKeeper allowances commenced, as it was paid in arrears. His only option was to obtain a commercial loan to cover the salary payments, which imposed additional costs in interest rates and other fees. In another example, a carpentry business in Werowa had registered for JobKeeper but felt the information they had to rely on was insufficient to make proper decisions. This business could not afford to pay the wages in advance, and that's why, I was told, they applied for JobKeeper in the first place. It's also, it, it has also appeared the government has set up the program without consideration for small businesses like this. Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, while I hear from honest, hard-working local business owners and people who find themselves unemployed daily about the delays in receiving payments, I'm also angered to hear of some of the rorts that have been going on. I've heard stories about businesses telling their employees they were going to retain part of the payment for administration purposes. Other uh, stories that employers who've lost their job were offered to return, but only if the business retained part of the JobKeeper payment. And whilst I know there was a dob in line, employees were concerned about recriminations if they did so. To rip off hard-working employees who need to put food on their table is just outrageous and un-Australian. But that's what happens when a program is unclear to overly complex for both government and participants of the program, and start dates are delayed so long that there were, the only choice they had was to close. In most in New South Wales, most nursing homes are still limiting the number of visitors that they are allowing. The aged care system relies not only on those paid workers, but it also relies heavily on volunteers and family members of those in care. These restrictions have meant that volunteers and family members are not able to visit aged care facilities to provide the level of assistance to the facility the workers, the family members and the residents rely on. I've heard from a constituent about the mental health challenges his loved one has had because of the lockdown and having little support. Further still, with over 100,000 people waiting for support on the aged care package list, isolating at home further impacted their quality of life. I've spoken in this place previously about the great impact that local government has had in my part of the world in southwestern Sydney. I've spoken about council staff, their incredible contributions that they make. But I'm deeply concerned that local councils are not eligible for JobKeeper. This places a further 40,000 jobs at risk right around our, company, our country. Council will maintain absolutely necessary social health and welfare service. So it really beggars belief that the government will not ensure these employees keep their job and those services are maintained for the community. Keeping their job will also help our economy. 
Unfortunately, due to the nature of social restrictions, the ability of charities to raise funds and continue providing necessary activities and services to our community has been destro destroyed and the government needs to consider some sort of specific support to them. Close lengthy proximity increases over the past months will only increase the chances of domestic violence and abuse in our uh, community. This also means that much, it, it is much harder for victims to get the help they need. The Sydney Women's Domestic Violence Court Advocacy Service has said that many people are suffering right now, but they can't make the call. The Liverpool Women's Resource Centre, um, when I spoke to them recently, also reports a large increase in requests and need of support. And they have given out probably 50% more food vouchers and hampers to those who have lost their job or are suffering domestic violence and have had to flee. The workers have had to read between the line on many, uh, on many, in many circumstances because the person that they were speaking to um, was talking to them in code because the perpetrator was in the house with them. We need to make sure their services can continue to do the extremely important work they do so all Australians can get help when and if they need it. I fear that many victims out there are unable to make this call and even if they can, they're unable to get the immediate help they need because of the lack of other housing options. The government needs to understand there are volunteer community groups and other organisations pro providing key and vital services to communities right around Australia to ensure, and needs to ensure that they continue operations to support them during this time and beyond. What these groups do takes up so much, so much demand away from government agencies. The groups contribute $129 billion into the Australian economy each year. I have no doubt we needed to act quickly and I accept the need to act quick in the need to act quickly gaps will emerge but the gaps must be filled when major cracks emerge in our society it's more important than ever for those who fall through to be assisted I'd like to thank our community of Werriwa for the positive um, outlook they've had during this extremely challenging time I've heard so many stories received so many calls and emails about the great actions of so many Local business owners who take food to those who are at risk and are vulnerable. Some of our charities who've been working nearly 24-7 to provide support and also neighbours checking in on each other. While this is a challenging time for all of us, through all of this our community will grow stronger, our country stronger and we may come out of it, let's hope, a more caring, understanding and positive community. I thank the member for Werriwa for her valuable contribution. The question is that the document be noted and I give the call to the member for Paterson. Thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker. Australians, Australia's collective response to the COVID-19 pand pandemic, Australia's greatest challenge in 75 years, is something that we should all be proud of. In terms of health outcomes, with 7,276 cases and 101 deaths, we're doing much better than many other countries. But we still have a long way to go. The world is still in this crisis and this virus is still circulating. We must acknowledge how far we've come, but we have a long way to go. In the Hunter region, we have had no new cases in the last six weeks. I want to acknowledge the Minister for Health, the Department of Health, the Chief Health Medical Officer and the New South Wales Premier for this good outcome. I want to thank our frontline workers, particularly the staff of the Hunter New England Health and our hospitals and doctors who have made such an effort to protect our community. I went to the Raymond Terrace Community Respiratory Clinic and got tested. It wasn't a pleasant experience, it stung. But I want to thank Drs Damien Wellborn and Sarah Bailey for their exemplary care. Uh, it was an uncomfortable but quick test. I post, uh, was obviously came back negative. But I want to thank them for setting up a professional practice that is helping many people in our community. And please keep getting tested. Don't just think it's okay, it's all over. If you feel unwell, go and get a test. 
whilst all Australians have had to sacrifice the burden. Let's face it, it hasn't been shouldered equally. Those working in the front line, tourism, hospitality and the arts have had the most job losses and the businesses have been impacted the most. Women have disproportionately lost the most jobs while taking on most of the caring and responsibilities at home. Many young people have lost their jobs with their working lives ahead of them. They've been faced with that first sting of not being employed. And they're going to have to carry these economic cans for years to come. And the costs of these decisions that we make right now in this place will be carried by those people. Significant economic policies have been rolled out rapidly with well over $200 billion in stimulus packages. And whilst this has supported many Australians, there are still many being locked out of really critically needed assistance. Labor has taken a constructive approach. We've identified gaps and delays, and we've called for action where it's needed. As the months roll on, this government must do more to help those who are in need of assistance. Childcare has rightfully taken its place under this harsh spotlight during the crisis. Many years of bad childcare policy has created a broken and expensive childcare system. The crisis has exposed the neglect of this government on the next generation of Australians through thoughtless and underfunded childcare policies. The Liberal Nationals have overseas and overseen an increase in childcare costs by 34 per cent since they were first elected. This has been compounded by a rescue package that really has created winners and losers at a time when we're all being told we're all in this together. I held an emergency Zoom meeting with childcare and early education providers last month and invited Shadow Minister for Early Childhood Education, Amanda Rishworth, to be part of that so we could hear the issues firsthand that were being caused by these policy changes. These childcare providers made it clear the only thing worse than the current COVID pol policy was snapping back to the old one. The COVID-19 rescue package has left parents without childcare spots while they need uh, and uh, childcare spots they need, and conversely, educators without the work that they desire. How is that a great system? Now they're going to snap back to very expensive childcare fees, whilst many families are still struggling financially. The Morrison government has a complete lack of understanding about the childcare and early education sector. Many families are under financial strain right now, and adding sky-high childcare fees on top of this is unfair. Parents relying on JobKeeper for income can't afford fees for childcare rates uh, before the pandemic, and uh, they're really struggling now. The government's latest, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, might I might I just request that you conduct this conversation somewhere else, as I'm really being quite. Excuse me, Mr. Speaker, could I just ask that you conduct that conversation somewhere? I'm really being quite distracted by the ongoing conversation, and I think this is a matter that does deserve and require your full attention. Thank you. Many families are under financial strain right now, and adding sky-high childcare fees atop of that list is completely unfair. Parents relying on JobKeeper for income can't afford the fees for childcare at the rates before the pandemic, and the government's latest announcement on the transition phase goes to centres, not the parents. Parents looking at returning to work or increasing their hours, which we desperately need for our economy, will have to think about whether they can afford to. No one should have to think about whether they can afford to go back to work or have their children adequately cared for and educated. Early educators on JobKeeper thought they at least had certainly until September, but now JobKeeper is being ripped out from underneath them in a few weeks. Providers are already struggling to keep their doors open. Going back to the old system of high fees risks lower attendance and revenue. Here presents an opportunity to do something different to build a better early education 
childcare system, yeah. one that works for every working parent. And I plead with the government to do more to fix this childcare crisis so that parents can get back to work and children can get that early education that we actually need to build a better country, to build better citizens. And in the long run, if you want to talk about the economy, it builds a far more prosperous economy as well. So, JobKeeper. This government must fix JobKeeper. Look, we all said it, it was necessary and it was a good idea, but we know, being honest, it was speedily rolled out. It is ridiculous that some people's casual income has doubled or tripled to $750 a week, whilst others have lost their income and are getting absolutely no support. JobKeeper does need to be better targeted. It's creating a big debt that we'll have to furnish in the future, and it must be used to support critical industries. We on this side of the chamber know that that has to include education. This government really needs to come to terms with the value of education. And for the life of me, I can't understand why my free market colleagues don't get this. From early education right through to university, our educators have been on the front line and not getting the assistance they need. Whilst early educators are set to lose JobKeeper next month, university workers have been locked out from the program from the get-go. And today it was revealed that the brilliant University of Newcastle has climbed into the ranks of the world's top 200 universities. And that is a fantastic thing. It's a regional university. It was started by the steel workers at the BHP. But it's under incredible pressure. The University of Newcastle, the Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Zelinsky, projected and told me last week that they're going to lose $46 million in fees for 2020. Now, this is a well run organisation. The University of Newcastle not only employs many people in our region, but it's a breeding ground for our brightest minds and, more importantly, best ideas. It's through collaboration with the university that local manufacturers were able to develop ventilators to help help us tackle this virus. But the government is happy to expose them to the winds of the world, the ill winds at the moment, cast them to those winds. Universities need to be supported and treated decently because they are the very petri dish where we grow the cure for corona. You know, it is no more basic than that. We need to be supporting them because fundamentally we need them. We need their bright ideas. We need their research. We need them for our future. And we need them for our economy. Another critical industry that has been overlooked is the arts. And uh, while everyone, everyone uh, that has had the luxury of being able to do so can cocoon at home and perhaps catch up on Netflix or, or binge on whatever it is they want to uh, binge on, we, we don't want to look after the people that are artistically creating all this stuff that we seem to somehow cocoon and rely on. And small businesses, mum and dad businesses in my electorate are really suffering. And I want to send a shout out to all of those businesses that completed my small business survey. We'll keep working for you and we'll Order. keep supporting you. Thanks, Mr. Honourable, Honourable Member's time has expired. I thank the member for Patterson and I give the call. I'm sorry, that the question is that the document be noted and I give the call to the member for Dobell. Deputy Speaker. Today I'd like to begin by drawing attention to the impact of COVID-19 on regional coastal communities across Australia, like mine on the central coast of New South Wales. Communities built on the shoulders of tourism, retail, hospitality, construction and the service industries. Communities hit hard when restrictions were introduced. Communities where the road ahead to recovery is long and bumpy. We haven't all quarantined equally and won't snap back to normal come September when the last of the government supports are wound back. Deputy Speaker, in recent months, Australia has faced ongoing drought, bushfire, floods and the COVID-19 pandemic. And the impact has hit hard in regional and remote Australia. In late May, the Grattan Institute released its job losses caused by COVID-19 report by electorate. And my community saw a sharp fall of 5.7 per cent. Our local economy, as I mentioned, is built on hospitality, retail, tourism and construction. And the impact of restrictions on small businesses and local jobs has been devastating. I've heard from families where both parents have lost their jobs on the same day. Danny of Nora Head works in gaming and his wife has her own graphic design business. They're both now on JobKeeper. And Danny tells me he can't see himself earning a normal wage for up to two years. Far too many people have fallen through the cracks and missed out on support altogether. Around Australia, up to 1.1 million casual workers will miss out on a wage subsidy. 
and potentially be forced into the unemployment queue because the Morrison government has stuffed up on JobKeeper. Young people like Ryan of Bad Bay in my electorate. Ryan is a heart transplant recipient who lives with a daily regime of immunosuppressant medication. Ryan strictly followed medical advice and self-isolated at home. But his employer didn't meet the turnover test and he's too young to be considered independent, so he's relying on his parents to get by. I wrote to Minister Robert over a month ago on Ryan's behalf and I'm still waiting on a response. It was Labor who pushed for a wage subsidy when the government was stubbornly ruling it out. Then for weeks, the Morrison government has been telling casuals and other excluded workers that the JobKeeper program was full, when in reality, it was three million workers short. Thousands of hardworking young people like Ryan shouldn't miss out because the PM and Treasurer were wrong by three million workers and $60 billion. One group who have been doing it particularly tough in my electorate and across Australia as we face COVID-19 are parents of children living with disability. Costs of NDIS programs have gone up while face-to-face -face supports have fallen away, making life just that much harder for these people and their families. And yet those parents on carer payment have received very little additional financial support from the government as COVID-19 continues to unfold. Parents like Karen of Hamlin Terrace in my electorate, a mother to eight with seven still at home, four homeschooled and two living with disabilities. Karen receives a carer payment and carer allowance and asks why at the moment is she now worse off than other single parents as we face COVID-19. Parents like Karen deserve better from this government. Or those caring for the aged and others more vulnerable to COVID-19 who have found their responsibilities just that much harder with increasing social isolation. They've faced higher costs, shortages of essential items such as medicines and flu vaccines, and the very real fear of what will happen to their loved one if they catch COVID-19. Patrick of Bad Bay called me. He has cared for his 91-year-old mother since his father, a war veteran, passed away 11 years ago. She's immobile and living with dementia. When not caring for his mum, Patrick volunteers at Lifeline and is undertaking a Certificate 3 in alcohol and other drugs. He told me he feels that carers at the front line like him, who are keeping older people safe, protecting them and keeping them out of our hospitals, are being disrespected. He asked why can service providers get a 10% loading while he struggles to get by and take care of his mum. He says, and I quote, Carers for old Australians have been forgotten. Carers like Patrick deserve better from this government. Deputy Speaker, the impact of this pandemic has not been shouldered equally. We don't all quarantine the same, and it, this has been particularly true for women, with many finding themselves out of work at the same time as their caring responsibilities have grown. Across the board, we've already seen worrying evidence of this inequality, and sadly, the Morrison government has only made it worse, not better. The first release of ABS, ABS data since COVID-19 showed that not only were women more likely to have lost their job after the emergence of COVID-19, they had also lost more wages than men in the same period. Sadly, many are now facing homelessness and some family violence. I spoke to a woman with a disability who had faced years of family violence and was at risk of losing her home, a home that had been modified to meet her specific needs Women and children need more support, not less, as we face COVID-19. Deputy Speaker, it must be said that Australia's world-class health system and care, underpinned through Medicare, have largely been the foundations of our success in the fight against COVID-19. But well before this pandemic reached our shores, we've been raising concerns that basic health care is becoming unaffordable and out of reach for many Australians. Medicare figures confirm what Australians already know, that the out-of-pocket cost to see a doctor is higher than ever before. The government's own data shows that the average out-of-pocket cost to see a GP in my electorate of Dobell on the New South Wales Central Coast is $32.65, up over $7 since the Liberals were elected. The same is true for the cost of seeing a specialist. The average out-of-pocket cost to see a specialist in Dobell is now close to $90 up $28 or 50% since the Liberals were elected. These costs, particularly as we face COVID-19, are pushing household budgets to breaking points. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, the government's own experts, say that 1.3 million Australians a year delay or avoid Medicare services due to cost. That's worth repeating. 
In a country that prides itself on universal access to healthcare, over a million people each year can't afford basic healthcare. According to the ABS, 961,000 people a year delay or avoid taking prescribed medicines due to cost. As a pharmacist and one who worked in our local public hospital for many years, I've seen the consequences of people delaying or avoiding essential treatment, what that means to them, their prognosis and their health outcomes, and what that means to our economy is well understood and must be addressed. The rate of people skipping prescriptions is twice as high in the most disadvantaged areas than in the least disadvantaged areas, meaning that the cost of medicines is contributing to health inequality in Australia today. Deputy Speaker, I'll now turn to mental health. I know something close to your heart. The Black Dog Institute's Mental Health Ramifications of COVID-19 report highlighted four groups that have increased risks during an outbreak. People with pre-existing anxiety disorders and mental health problems, healthcare workers, people being placed in quarantine, and people who were underemployed, unemployed, or found themselves in casual work. As the COVID-19 pandemic reached Australian shores, we saw an immediate spike in demand for mental health support. In March, Lifeline answered almost 90,000 calls for help, calls taken by people like Patrick in My Electric, an increase of 25% compared to the same period last year, or one call every 30 seconds, the highest call frequency in Lifeline's 57-year history. Black Dog saw a 30% spike in contacts to their support service in the last two weeks of March. On some days, a third of contacts were COVID-19 related. A survey from Black Dog released in May found 78% of respondents reported their mental health had been worse since COVID-19. That's 78% of respondents. And over 50% of respondents were moderately to extremely worried about their financial situation. Deputy Speaker, we know the consequences of unemployment, financial distress and the mental health anguish they can cause. Suicide Prevention Australia's Turning the Tide report, which was released in March, showed that well-established link between unemployment, financial distress and mental health crisis which means people who are unemployed are nine times more likely to take their own life than working people. As hundreds of thousands of Australians lost their jobs and businesses folded, lives have been broken. People in financial distress facing financial hardship across Australia deserve better from this government. Whilst we welcome the investment that they've made, there is much more still to be done and it's urgent. Deputy Speaker, I would like to finish with some heartfelt thanks on behalf of my community to the health professionals from the chief medical officers and chief nurse and midwifery officer through to the frontline staff in ICU, mental health, to our hospital cleaners and those running COVID-19 testing centres. You've all done an outstanding job, often putting yourselves in harm's way. Your dedication and selflessness has meant many that has meant Australia has avoided some of the devastation seen in other countries. To the retail workers, cleaners, transport workers, childcare workers, age and disability workers who have gone to work so we can stay safely at home, thank you. And an unfortunate truth is that many of these are the worst paid and hardest working Australians. I'd like to also acknowledge the Centrelink staff and give a shout out to the those at Wild Hospital. Thank the member for Durbell. Uh, for her contribution. The question is that the document be noted and I give the call to the member for Mayo. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, I'd like to start by thanking the healthcare workers and their families who week after week walked into the hospitals, the GP clinics and the testing centres, never quite sure if it was the day that they would be overwhelmed, like their colleagues in Italy, the UK or the US, while Australia did flatten the curve, I, I cannot begin to imagine, imagine the toll that this, this has taken on our healthcare workers. I want to thank Chief Medical Officer Brendan Murphy and his deputies, as well as South Australia's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr Nicola Spurrier, for their leadership and guidance in recent weeks. Their briefings quickly became part of our daily routine and phrases such as flattening the curve and social distancing are now part of our Australian vernacular. I'd like to acknowledge the work of the state government, in particular our Premier Stephen Marshall, Minister Wade and Police Commissioner Grant Stevens. Stephen Marshall's, uh, our Premier's mother, said that uh, he was born for this and can I say his leadership has been extraordinary. Finally, I want to thank the community. It was in no part due 
uh, no, no small part due to the disciplined and determined approach to following the health advice and abiding by government restrictions that we were able to avoid the calamitous events which unfolded elsewhere and are still unfolding in the world. Worldwide, more than 7 million people have been diagnosed with COVID-19 and over 400,000 people are estimated to have died. The numbers are almost beyond comprehension. And when they com compare to our national and state data, we have been incredibly fortunate in this country, and that is no small part um, because of our government, both state and federal. In South Australia, there are currently no active cases of COVID-19, and it has been over two weeks since the last reported case. But I also recognise that many families and friends have lost loved ones, only to have that loss compounded by their inability to grieve as they would wish due to the restrictions. For others, the physical separation has taken its toll. I'm particularly concerned to hear from distressed family members who were, and some still are, repeatedly being denied access to their families and friends in aged care facilities. And I wish to thank Aged Care Rights Advocacy for their assistance in helping older people and their family members to understand their rights and for working with residential aged care providers to workshop solutions to the visitation restrictions. The staff at aged care residents across uh, our electorate worked hard to find new ways to ensure residents remain connected, including video calls and window visits. And the Adelaide Hills Council have launched their Cards for Kindness campaign, where school children write postcards to residents in aged care. While this is a poor substitute for a hug or someone holding your hand or a long chat over a pot of tea, it shows the capacity we have for kindness in the face of great uncertainty and fear. I have the oldest electorate by median age in South Australia, and that fear and concern was very much felt on our south coast, which is also an area where we normally experience an enormous amount of tourism. Our Mayo community has risen to the occasion and faced the challenge with a great sense of camaraderie. Um, for example, at the height of the pandemic buying, um, the local IGA at Mount Barker went above and beyond to ensure that those who needed essential supplies were always able to access them, including the Meadows Out of Hours school, school care team. Each day, the Meadows Osh feeds between 10 and 15 children breakfast before school and another, another 30 tired and hungry students at the end of the school day. But at the height of the pandemic, buying the sources and supplies they needed to feed their children was just impossible. In stepped Joe from the team at Mount Barker IGA, who not only supplied enough groceries for the remainder of the term, but threw in Easter eggs too so the children could have an Easter egg hunt. In the words of Carolyn uh, G from the Meadows Osh, this action has made us reflect on our business choices of supplies. We are hoping to move very quickly to an account with Mount Barker IGA, locally owned. So much better for all of us. As we move out of the pandemic and into our next challenge, the economic recovery, we need to support our local businesses as they too adapt to a changing landscape. And I'd just like to mention a few businesses in my community that I think have done an extraordinary job of adapting. Prancing Pony and, and, and Sidewood Estate, they're two businesses who have been able to adapt and navigate a pathway uh, through the restrictions. There are many others who will simply never reopen their doors. For many, the bushfires have been a devastating blow, but it was the COVID that stopped their recovery. I'd also like to mention Sylvia from Walls That Talk. She changed her business model. She used to make wallpaper, um, corporate wallpaper, but then she moved to making COVID signage. Um, and my offices in Mount Barker and Victor Harbour have her COVID safe signage everywhere, on the floor, on the walls. I'd also like to mention a local COVID relief fund. Um, and this is what community does. With my um, colleague, my uh, state uh, member in, in one of my areas, the member for Carville, Dan Cregan, uh, and our, uh, one of our local mayors, uh, uh, Anne Ferguson, we got together and realised that there would be people in our community um, that would be suffering, that perhaps have very big mortgages, they've never had interactions with Centrelink before, um, and they, they were really struggling to feed their children. We've had over 200 uh, families every week access the pantry, and we've come together to create a fund so that uh, with Rotary, where we can put money in and we can work with 
local businesses to uh, have in the deep freezer, local takeaway meals, as well as a range of fresh fruit and vegetables and other dry goods. And we're putting our own personal money into this fund, but we know that much in our, many in our community who also have capacity to give are doing this. We're all caring and supporting for each other, and that is what this is all about. Well, there is a light on the horizon. And the clearest sign of life returning to normal is surely the return of the showdown for South Australians and the announcement that 2,000 supporters can be cheering for our state's greatest rivalry, I think is, um, is incredibly exciting for so many of us. Most importantly though, local sport is coming back and I will be standing on the sidelines uh, with my gloves on, cheering with the rest of our community. And we believe we'll be able to do that in July. We've each done our part to successfully flatten the curve, but I urge all members of our community to follow the health advice and health experts. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I would just like to finish with a shout out from a wonderful business called the Quarter Mile Cafe. A gentleman called um, Dave, he makes soups and meals. No questions asked. If you need assistance, you just come in and get some soup for your family. And he has made um, thousands of litres of soup. Um, and I've uh, personally um, dropped off uh, uh, some of my own pumpkins from our garden just to help out um, with his soup. He's doing an extraordinary job. It's all of these people in our community, all these heroes in our community who have made our community um, come through what has been a devastating time uh, for many right across. Thank you. I thank the member for Mayo. The uh, member for Bowman has the call. Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. I move the debate be adjourned, and uh, the resumption of the debate. Thank you. We made an order of the day for next meeting. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against, I think the ayes have it. The Federation Chamber is adjourned until suspended, four, suspended until 4 p.m. this afternoon. Uh, I call the clerk. Uh, committee and delegation business. Order of the day number one, report from the Joint Standing Committee on Trade and, and Investment Growth. The question is that the document be noted and I call the member for Higgins. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Yesterday, the Joint Standing Committee on Trade and Investment Growth, of which I am a member, handed down the inquiry report terms trade transformation supporting Australia's export and investment opportunities. I want to acknowledge and thank the Chair, George Christensen, the Committee Secretariat and the rest of the committee for the excellent work that went into this report. The inquiry heard from witnesses across the full range of Australia's export industries. It reiterated that Australia is an export nation. In 2018-2019, exports reached almost $470 billion, or 24% of our GDP. It noted that while our resource exports remain strong, we have a growing opportunity to build on our service exports. Currently, these account for a fifth of Australia's exports. We heard of Australia's strength in the higher education sector, which is our fourth biggest export. We also heard of our emerging strengths in other services, including health, professional and financial, financial services, often called fintech, and travel. However, it also identified a need for diversification. The Export Council's submission described Australia's exports as too small and too concentrated. We export from a small number of businesses, set a small number of commodities, sell a small number of commodities, and those sales are disproportionately geared for one market. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought home this issue. We need to rapidly open up export opportunities for a post-COVID global economy. In particular, the report re recommended the government investigate ways of encouraging the growth of our non-resource sector. This was noted in recommendation number 20, which recommends that health as an export, and in particular, telehealth and clinical trials present a real opportunity for Australia. Recommendation number one recommends the attractive construct 
of the Biomedical Translation Fund and suggest this model for updating our trade and investment strategy. The committee heard that international health is where education was 20 to 30 years ago. We are on the cusp of an exciting opportunity to take our health expertise to international markets through services such as telehealth, clinical trials and medical education and training. In particular, recommendation number three of the report identified significant bureaucratic barriers to increasing our clinical trials capability due to our federated healthcare system and requirement to get state-by-state -state regulatory approval for multi-centre trials. There is an urgency to deal with this issue so that Australia can take advantage of our low COVID environment. Mr Deputy Speaker, there's been many pivots to grasp from the COVID crisis. One of the great developments to arise from the COVID pandemic has been the rapid expansion of telehealth services here in Australia. The expanded use of telehealth will undoubtedly be a feature of post-COVID healthcare here in Australia. It also has the potential to form part of a more diversified and digital-based post-COVID economy. Telehealth was, help, was used to deliver convenient, cost-effective and real-time healthcare to people across the country, particularly for those located in regional, rural and remote areas. It guarantees that a patient from Telangata has the same access to quality healthcare as a patient from Turak. Likewise, it means that the metropolitan-based patient doesn't have to wrestle with traffic congestion to get to a quick checkup across town. It has been critical to patient and doctor safety during the pandemic and has helped protect our critical PPE supply. At its core, telehealth is about driving greater efficiency in healthcare delivery, which delivers on consumer productivity. Who wants to take off half a day to get a health check when you can now dial into your doctor from your desk at work? Members of the government, including myself, have long been of the view that increasing our telehealth services is a valuable investment. The COVID-19 pandemic has streamlined this. The expansion of telehealth services that would have otherwise taken 10 years was instead achieved in just 10 days. The government introduced a $669 million whole of population telehealth primary health care program. This involved opening up telehealth and telephone Medicare benefit schedule items to all Australians and doubling the bulk billing incentive for GPs. More than 9 million services have been provided to date. Mr Deputy Speaker, geographically, we are ideally placed to seize this opportunity. The cultural diversity of our medical profession is also well suited to the challenge of inter implementing international health. It is critical that in the post-COVID world we look to ahead, we should modernise our economy and play to our strengths. The rapid expansion of telehealth services has been a valuable asset for Australia and could also be mutually beneficial for our friends in the Asia-Pacific region. Our health sector provides unique trading opportunities. Australia is well positioned to become a world leader in health services export, built on an excellent reputation and internationally recognised outcomes for health. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the member. Uh, the question is, the document be noted, and I call the member for Fenner. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Free trade is under fire. We've seen a massive increase in the number of protectionist measures uh, around the world uh, and a significant pressure being placed on the global trading system. Uh, it's critical to realise the value that openness has played in building the modern Australian economy. Australia's trade barriers were brought down largely by successive Labor governments. The 25 per cent tariff cut by Gough Whitlam in 1973, uh, the significant tariff cuts in 1988 and 1991 by the Hawke government. Uh, the process of trade liberalisation delivered significant competitiveness into the Australian economy uh, and ensured that we created many more jobs, and it uh, improved the living standards for many Australian households. As Adam Triggs has recently pointed out, uh, compared with a decade order, ago, order, order. audiovisual. Can we just keep it down a little bit? It's distracting the member who's, uh, who's speaking. Thank you. Audiovisual and computing equipment is 72% cheaper. Cars are 12% cheaper. Toys and games are 18% cheaper. 
and clothes are 14 per cent cheaper. Uh, so trade has stretched Austra the household budgets further for low and middle income Austra Australian households. Uh, but the rise in protectionist measures does threaten the, many of these gains. The Smoot-Hawley tariff might not have caused the Great Depression, but it certainly act, acted to exacerbate the duration of the crisis. And there is again a risk that rising protectionism around the world will do the same. We're already seeing significant trade tensions between the United States and China, uh, but that's just one context in which trade conflicts uh, are becoming worse mm. in the current environment. Uh, trade, uh, along with immigration and foreign investment, uh, have been critical to Australia's prosperity. Australia is a country that has chosen openness. It's been a deliberate policy choice, largely uh, supported by both sides of this House, uh, and one which has improved Austra Australia's growth rate. Uh, but it, all of that could easily come to, come to an end uh, if we are to succumb to the siren song of protectionism uh, and to close off trade. Uh, as uh, the ANU's Adam Triggs has pointed out, um, some have suggested that uh, a national Buy Australian campaign could fully compensate for our trade. Uh, he calls this a, quote, laughable proposition, pointing out that more than 70 per cent of our agricultural production is exported. More than 25 per cent of our tourism industry uh, relies on international tourists. Uh, to say nothing, as he points out, uh, of universities and mining. Uh, the uh, same, same effect is uh, seen in foreign investment. Uh, as, uh, uh, we, as we well know, Australia has, one of the high, has traditionally had one of the highest current account deficits in the world, uh, fifth largest current account deficit in the world just re recently, uh, and still uh, we receive significant amounts of foreign investment, although the increase in our domestic superannuation pool now means that we're both an outbound foreign investor in order to manage uh, risks for Austra Australian investors while still accepting significant amounts of inbound foreign investment. Uh, inbound foreign investment accounts for about $1.09 of total investment, so a complete shutoff of foreign investment uh, would mean a one-ninth decrease in total investment in Australia. That would have massively adverse implications uh, for investment in the manufacturing industry, uh, in roads, bridges, ports. Uh, light rail projects have been uh, backed by foreign investment uh, and they have benefited Australians raising living standards uh, and increasing jobs. Uh, there's also a national security benefit to this. Uh, when uh, foreign investors, uh, be they American, Chinese or Japanese, uh, invest in the Australian economy, they have a stake in our success. They have a stronger interest in the Australian economy doing well uh, when, they are, when they're, they're part of it. Uh, as uh, uh, Adam Triggs has pointed, pointed out in the piece in the Canberra Times recently, uh, when uh, for, for many years Indonesia imposed restrictions on Australia's beef exports. Uh, but after Indonesian companies invested in Australia's beef industry, the Indonesian government's incentive to restrict imports was significantly reduced. Uh, as he put it, suddenly Indonesia had skin in the game. Suddenly they had an interest in the Australian beef export sector doing well. Uh, we can understand the uh, concerns over, uh, the, uh, over openness. Uh, this is, after all, uh, a pandemic uh, which came from overseas. Uh, but simply to take the view uh, that when we're faced with a pandemic from overseas, we should immediately uh, roll up the uh, drawbridges and shut off our engagement with the world would be to learn the wrong lessons. Uh, in, uh, the, in, in past, uh, past uh, pandemics have shown, um, often the uh, solutions will come from overseas. I agree with the uh, former speaker who spoke about the importance of clinical trials. Labor put a policy on improving clinical trials to the last election. It's absolutely vital, we uh, do more of them, uh, but major clinical trials now aren't occurring in a single country. Uh, the typical major clinical trial is an international trial. Uh, so we've got massive globalisation of this sector and it's in our interest to be part of that globalisation. Our universities are engaged with the rest of the world. Uh, Nobel laureate, now ANU uh, Vice-Chancellor Brian Schmidt has said that perhaps nowhere else could he have done his path-breaking path research which earned him a Nobel Prize. 
because his research group was so internationally connected. Uh, temporary migration plays an important part in our universities, uh, not just with students, but also faculty uh, flowing to and fro our universities. That exchange of ideas makes our universities significantly more productive. Uh, we're already seeing uh, challenges to, uh, to uh, equity through both trade and technology, but too often uh, the uh, uh, impact of technology is blamed on trade. Uh, as Tim Harcourt has mentioned recently, uh, artificial intelligence and robotics have already been changing the nature of work in manufacturing. Uh, and uh, he points out that that effect is only likely to continue. Uh, but uh, uh, we need to be cautious of not uh, blaming the impact on employment that occurs as a result of technological shifts uh, on our openness to trade. Yes, trade has an impact, but technology is the, uh, the larger factor. How are we going to be uh, affected uh, in terms of our exports by the current crisis? Uh, we've seen a massive hit to tourism, massive hit to the university sector. Um, rocks and crops have remained, uh, remained steady, uh, and uh, overseas steel production has held up, uh, meaning that, uh, that our uh, iron ore has, uh, has maintained. Uh, but there's certainly a, a risk in the future uh, that we might see, might see further protectionist measures that would adversely affect, affect Australia. Uh, Jeffrey Wilson from the uh, uh, US, US Study Centre and uh, Perth, Perth US Asia Centre um, has pointed out the importance uh, of uh, maintaining foreign investment to the, in the current, current context. Uh, he's pointed out that a shutdown of foreign investment would particularly affect our resources, manufacturing and real estate sectors. And he's highlighted the fact that in 2018 there was $3.5 trillion of accumulated foreign investment in Australia and that Australian firms held $2.5 trillion of assets abroad. Uh, so foreign investment flows go both ways. Uh, we benefit as superannuation investors uh, from foreign, uh, foreign investment. Uh, but we can hardly expect that if we turn off foreign investment for uh, over overseas investors, uh, that it will continue to be possible for Australian superannuation funds to get the benefit of diversification uh, that comes through foreign investment. Uh, finally, it would be remiss of me to end a speech on trade uh, without referring to the extraordinary export rorts revelations that have been reported by David Crowe in the, Fairf in the nine Fairfax papers today. Uh, we have seen fully 97% of the money go to coalition electorates. Uh, that is, uh, in round one of the program, some $4.3 million going to coalition electorates uh, compared to $140,000 uh, to Labor electorates. Now, what the government is saying is, well, that's OK. Uh, we're sure we pork barreled 97% before the election, but after the election, we ran another program. Uh, and that, pro that program was broadly 50-50, so it's OK. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a bit like saying, uh, well, you, uh, you, you uh, did an illegal tackle on the field, but after the final bell rang, uh, you went and gave the, gave the bloke a hug. I mean, the fact is, this was a rort during the election campaign. And no second round post-election makes up for the malfeasance that occurred in this program. It deserves a thorough inquiry. Australians have a right to know why this export grants program was used for Order, partisan the member's pork time barreling. Is, uh, finished. Uh, the question is that the document be noted, and I call the member for Solomon. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to uh, thank the member for Fenner uh, for his contribution and for reminding me about rocks and crops. Uh, <laughs> We uh, do plenty of mining up in the Territory and uh, we want to do uh, more and more agriculture, as you're well aware, Mr Deputy Speaker. And we all know that it was on the proverbial sheep's back that Australia's wealth was made, as well as on the back-breaking work of the tough men and women who made that industry. But it was also on the back of cows and cattle farmers, agriculture, wine, wine growers, iron ore, coal and natural gas. Uh, the miners, the engineers, the truckies, LNG, carrier workers and the many more professionals that have made these industries so productive and enriching for Australia. 
And that's only when we think of goods that have been dug up, farmed, cultivated and exported to the world, competing with economic giants half an ocean away and often dominating markets by the quality of our goods and our professional people. Thanks to Australia's uh, economic opening, mainly by Labor governments, it must be said, uh, this trade transformation contributed massively to the decades of uninterrupted growth that we've enjoyed. It was these macroeconomic settings put in place by visionary economic decision making and in fact nation building that allowed what became known as the terms of trade boom between roughly 2005 and 2011, on the back of those high commodity prices. But another transformation in the Australian economy has been our transition to very large services exporter, not least of which is our export of education and training in our university and TAFE systems. And uh, I reflect, Mr Deputy Speaker, on conversations uh, being had about this with experts uh, around Monash University that will be starting up uh, in Indonesia in the near future. Um, but thanks to this transformation and to the technological revolutions which have allowed it, many of our unis managed to transition rapidly to online learning environments during the COVID-19 crisis to avoid the worst case scenario. And of course, not all were so lucky and the reliance on certain group of eight universities on international students has raised legitimate questions, I think, about the sector, uh, within the sector itself, uh, about the resilience uh, against external shocks like we've seen with COVID-19. Higher education is just another example of how important international trade has become to the Australian economy. The university sector supports about 240,000 Australian jobs and a big whack of jobs in my electorate in Darwin. It's actually now our fourth largest export earner and we're talking about around $40 billion a year. Now, it's absolutely massive. And at a time when our universities are in crisis, it has beggared belief that the Australian government has turned its back on the thousands of Australian jobs that are likely to be lost if this sector continues on the path that it's on. And I'm sure honourable members are aware that uh, university uh, employees uh, haven't been able to access uh, JobKeeper, for example. And we are talking about 21,000 jobs in the sector being cut if we keep on this track, and a $19 billion drop in overseas student revenue. Now that money the overseas students bring to Australia is spent on research in our universities. It's spent on teaching for all the students, uh, including our Aussie students, uh, not just those overseas students. So it's fair to say, Deputy Speaker, that international trade in all its shapes and sizes has made a large and even dominant contribution uh, to Australian economic growth in past decades. Uh, this is thanks, as we have seen, to Australia's um, economic opening. Now, of course, this opening hasn't always been perfectly successful and we can, can and should regret the key manufacturing and industrial capabilities have been lost and often sacrificed by federal governments that tended to drink too much Kool-Aid <coughs> that economic globalisation had no costs or losers. But Mr Deputy Speaker, I think, it's, <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that in the middle of the national COVID crisis, we woke up to the painful reality, decades too late, that we had traded off key assets of our sovereignty and self-reliance in an unthinking search for economic efficiencies uh, and a balanced budget. So there's been a lot of soul searching about um, how much self-sufficiency we want to have, uh, how much uh, heavy manufacturing we want to have here. We obviously need to be making our own PPE. Um, we still want to attract foreign investment, tourists and students, uh, which we need, but we shouldn't only look at it on our terms. 
because the result of that would be predictably disastrous. <clears throat> we can't have it our own way every day. Our, econ our economy benefits disproportionately from trading rules uh, which we help to build and as, whose observance continues to be in our national interest. So I think, as the member for Fenner said, we need to avoid uh, this push to become more and more protectionist. We must, we must find the balance, uh, what's smart for our economy. <coughs> so COVID-19 laid bare uh, the excesses of Australia's deindustrialisation. Uh, trading off self-reliance and resilience in vital sectors like fuel security, uh, the production of pharmaceuticals, uh, manufacturing and emergency stockpiling. And that point on uh, fuel security um, is an important one and we've had some positive uh, discussions in recent times about uh, uh, the need to diversify uh, our storage, but most importantly to have our storage uh, on Australian soil. I think because of COVID-19, surely now we have a national consensus uh, that this just-in-time supply lines, uh, which are incredibly efficient and do drive down prices at Woolies, for example, uh, come with built-in risks that we have to manage and not just uh, worsen uh, by shutting ourselves off from the world. A very much justified call for greater self-reliance can't give way to a populist attempt uh, to shut us off from the currents of global economic growth and investment, <coughs> because that's what protectionism would do. In short, uh, cutting off our nose to spite our face. Now, this is a kind of trade-off that we'll need to manage intelligently in the coming months and years. Getting the dial right between the extremes of total reliance on the world and total self-reliance, which will be an ongoing national project. Thanks very much. And this project goes far above politics. Um, it's it's important. It's not just about what you find at the, in the IGA aisle, but it's about whether we want to be the sort of country that feeds the world but has no food security. Do we want to be a country that has world-leading medical system but not enough face masks to protect us from deadly smoke and, and sneezes, coughs? Uh, we don't want to be a country that fuels global economic growth, but whose own tanks, as I said, with fuel storage are empty in peacetime and uh, would be a disastrous if they were empty in wartime. Uh, we don't want to be a country that educates South East Asia's elites, uh, while our literacy, numeracy, uh, university and Asian literacy rankings slide. <coughs> So as we balance diverse needs and make measured judgments uh, on trade, trade itself can and will be our economic saviour. As Shadow Trade Minister Madeline King has written, uh, there have always been good reasons for Australia to pursue sovereign industrial capabilities. Labor has long argued the case for lifting local manufacturing capacity that complements and builds on our comparative advantages. Thanks very much, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I, thank the, I thank the Speaker. I move that the debate be adjourned and a resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. The question is that the debate be adjourned for the resumption of the debate to be made in order of the day for the next sitting. Those with that opinion? Aye. The ayes have it. I move that the Federation Chamber do now adjourn. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Seconder. Oh, seconder, sorry. In the motion. <laughs> Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the Federation stands adjourned until 10am tomorrow.